Uh, okay, everyone. Uh, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the 12 game Tuesday we have uh, here on 29 August. Let's um, let's get into a pretty high scoring night last night. I mean, the optimal lineup was on DK was 317 points or something stupid. Uh, Acuna went crazy. Um, Josie Altuve hit for the cycle. Jordan Alvarez went four for four or five for five with two walks or, or something um a couple of guys we talked about that could have popped were also in the optimal lineup uh etc etc a lot of a lot of really high scoring um from a real life perspective right a lot of runs scored certainly from atlanta they got there mostly against the colorado bullpen because austin gomber got hurt had to come out um but some other teams you like Seattle put up runs, uh, Baltimore put up runs late, you know, Houston, of course, et cetera, et cetera. So really high scoring night last night. We kind of expected that, um, you know, not a lot that we could really get too excited about at the upper end of the pricing spectrum with the pitching. They were very popular and it made it pretty easy to pivot to some cheaper arms on the mound and just get everybody in the batter's box. Um, Maybe a slightly different construction here today. Not that Atlanta is not still at Coors Field, right? They get uh, Peter Lambert here tonight. We'll go over this game when we get there. Uh, they're going to be mega popular, far more popular tonight than they were last night because, well, the Padres got Adam Wainwright, and he promptly tore them apart. Um, I will bitch about the Padres when we get there. In any case, tonight... Expecting a little bit of a different type of optimal construction. Um, we don't have the same sort of ownership dynamic up here uh, with the top guys that we did yesterday, right? You had Gosman, Blake Snell, who was, you know, turned out to be fantastic. Um, and whoever else. I did somebody else above 10,000. I forget already. Um, all getting a lot of ownership. And that's not really the case for the top three guys, at least here today. Of course, George Kirby gets Oakland. Um, Brian Wu tore them apart last night and probably expects some of the same from George Kirby tonight. So he's seen all the ownership here at 9,700, which is fine. You know, it makes sense. But uh, these are still really good arms in some attackable matchups for sure for Pablo, Corbin Burns, and Kershaw even. And they're not seeing any ownership whatsoever. So I think... Um, you know, naturally, we do have a couple of really obvious spots down here. Alex Cobb getting Cincinnati tonight. He's at a super cheap price tag, 6800 Um That obviously makes sense. Cole Reagan's definitely seeing a lot of ownership, too. Getting Pittsburgh makes sense as well. However, um, you know, some of the guys in the mid-range, like we had available yesterday, notably a Yohan Oviedo through a complete game shutout, um, it, maybe they might not be available here tonight. You really want to play Mackenzie Gore, Dean Kramer, Seth Lugo, Brian Bayo, JP France, uh, Charlie Morton at Coors Field? I don't know. I don't know. So what that might suggest is that we do actually get to one of the top guys today uh, on the pricing spectrum, at least, and then mix in with one of you know our favorites, whoever it is, down here. We still want to attack... The red numbers, of course, Peter Lambert, right, sub-5 um, ownership or a point projection here naturally because he gets Atlanta. Um, in any case, that's how I'm kind of seeing, um, you know, my initial look here in terms of just pure construction. Yesterday we wanted to get to everybody in the batter's box. Today maybe not so much. Uh, we got some, some good arms going today, so let's just get into it and see if we can find some value. Let's start with the White Sox in Baltimore. Um, Jesse Schulten, this could be one of the super cheap guys that you could consider getting to. Uh, now, he's been terrible recently. The numbers are bad against right-handers, at least. Um, the suppression against the lefties has been pretty damn good. He's got some noise going on here in the sample because he's spent a lot of the time, or a lot of his time this season, coming out of the bullpen. Um, so kind of fishy right, that he's getting taken apart so terribly by right-handers here, 14% strikeout rate with a 243 ISO allowed and a 293 batting average. Kind of uh, fishy for a right-hander himself. Um, that's because he's just break-even, really, and everything he's throwing, he just kind of pipes everything here. For the most part, the 
plate discipline numbers are, are pretty okay for somebody that's not going to throw it past guys, right? 70% strikeout rate, that's not impressive. But the 8% walk rate's fine. 67% strike one is really good. 27% chase is okay with break-even secondaries here. And just a 9% swing strike rate, that's what's keeping the CSW down at 26%. But it's still 26% given the 17% call strike rate, right? So he's still serviceable a little bit. His last several outings have been terrible. Let's not get it confused. Um, and there's not a lot of upside. I don't think he's got much more than maybe 15, 18 points as a total ceiling here. This is still a difficult matchup against Baltimore, but I'm less on Baltimore tonight than I was last night. Um, well, mostly because it's... I mean, it's not that I res don't respect Baltimore against, you know, below-average right-handed arms. Um, I think their price tags are starting to climb a little bit out of my sort of comfort range, right? Rutch is up to 55. He still walks a hell of a lot here. And hitting from the left side, probably not going to see a um, a lot of production from him necessarily, right? Just 25% hard contact that Schultz is giving up against the lefties here tonight or on the season, rather. And that's really how we want to attack with some of these left-handers uh, from Baltimore. Gunner, in particular, he's up to 54. It's not like that's a horrible price tag for him, um, but we still need him to be able to make a lot of hard contact. I've got no problem playing him, of course, still dual eligible, and has some of the best numbers in baseball split adjusted. So that's, that's not really a problem necessarily, but Still just an 045 ISO allowed for Schultons. And you know, what's not necessarily a, t a tiny sample, 211 batting average over 125 hitters that he's seen this season. These are pretty good numbers, sub 25% hard contact rate. So um, it's just a lack of pure swing and miss that questions, or that makes me question rather, um, Schulton's upside here. So um, do I want to play a lot of Baltimore? Well, they're going to pop pretty hard. There's always value on Baltimore because we saw what they did last night all it takes is you know a bloop a walk and a, a three-run dinger um in the eighth inning or whatever and you're kind of off to the races um so that's fine you can always play them all these guys have plenty of upside price adjusted however Cedric is down they shoved him down in the seven hole um and he's 4900 that's really hard to get to even though I love Cedric like, he's 4900 That's kind of an expensive price tag when he leads off, for example. Um, we talked about Rutchen and Henderson. Uh, Santander's up to 45 Still very playable for him. Mountcastle, though, 48 Not excellent against right-handers himself. This is an okay spot. He'll be able to lift the baseball, make some uh, really hard contact. That's attractive. So it would be, it would be a couple of the right-handers here instead of the lefties that I'm most attracted to. But... As I mentioned, Mountcastle is kind of expensive at first base at 48, not the plus side of his platoon against right-handers. Same thing with Austin Hayes, not the greatest numbers against right-handers. Uh, so overall, not super thrilling necessarily to be playing Baltimore for me here tonight. I'd rather pivot it to some other stacks, I think. Um, I'll probably have some exposure, but they're, I, I mean, in the next game, we'll, we'll get to... Um, a team that I much prefer. So I'm kind of off of Baltimore here a little bit, and that may put me onto a little bit of Jesse Schultons. Um, not that I, he's similar to Kyle Muller last night. I don't want to do this, right, in a pretty bad spot. Uh, but he's 5,200, and I want to play as much as as much Atlanta as I as I can. And uh, they're still insanely expensive tonight. So um, that's kind of how I want to approach this. Uh, this might burn me, but. Um, I could be coming off of some Baltimore here. Dean Kramer, I'm not going to play him either. Um, 7,700, though, it could put him in play. He generally is kind of enigmatic a little bit. Um, he's similar to, like, a Kyle Gibson. Like, none of his stuff is really any good. And he gives up too many homers. He gives up too many fly balls and too, many, too much hard contact, too much power. Um... But he excels sometimes against bad teams, and he pops every now and then against a really good team. So he's kind of hard to figure out. Um, he's efficient early in the count. He doesn't walk a lot of people, and the barrel rate is still respectable, sub 10%. It's elevated for sure, but um, you know it's not 12%, 13% like we'll come across with some other starting pitchers today. 
does have six pitches, but none of them, as I mentioned, are, are really any good outside of a two-seamer that he doesn't really throw a lot, and he doesn't really induce ground balls with it. So it's um, overall pretty unimpressive. I like stacking against Dean Kramer. Unfortunately, this is the White Sox, and they're absolute trash. Um, Grayson Rodriguez tore them apart last night, and I kind of expect a little bit of a similar performance from Dean Kramer because this offense is so bad. However, now we can get into the pitch mixes a little bit. I don't know what Dean Kramer's doing over here. He's not getting value out of this cutter um, because he's throwing it mostly to same-handed hitters. And, I like, pitching coach has to jump in here. This is terrible. He's throwing this nearly 40% of the time to a right-hander, and he's only throwing it about 15 18% of the time to a left-hander. Um, so, like, I don't know what we're doing here, but you do not throw a cutter to same-handed hitters unless it is an elite pitch. There's a couple of guys with some really good cutters going tonight that we'll talk about. Uh, but a cutter is not a, a main fastball type of pitch that you throw to same-handed hitters. And that could put some of these White Sox in play. Now, Dean Kramer's cutter, he's not giving up a hell of a lot of power on it necessarily. Um, but he's not inducing the ground balls that he could be otherwise if he just use the sinker more against right-handers. He's throwing this more a little bit and laying off a little bit of the four-seamer, but there's something fishy going on here in his fastball mix. He could be a hell of a lot more efficient uh, to both sides of the plate if he sorted out uh, how he was distributing his arsenal here. Um, so... The cutter, a bad pitch against same-handed hitters. The White Sox still a pretty right-handed heavy lineup. Tim Anderson um, hit so many ground balls, but this is an okay batted ball matchup for him to kind of get the baseball on a line because Dean Kramer gives up some line drives north of 22% in aggregate here. I don't really want to be dealing with Andrew Benintendi at 3,800. I don't like the price tag for him, but there's some pop and you know a lack of strikeouts from Dean Kramer, some hard contact and fly balls that could match up pretty well for Ben Benintendi a little bit. Luis Roberts, always the best hitter. You can always play him. Um, and this is a pretty good bat of ball matchup for him, especially against a, a bad same-handed pitch. Same thing with Aloy. I do like you on Moncada at 3300 Price kind of jumping at me here. So you could find some White Sox. Um, I think I'd probably rather side with them, even though I don't want to play them pretty much at all. I do think Dean Kramer is in play because this is a bad team. But both sides, I think, are are squarely in play in deep tournament stuff as fillers. I don't want to full stack the White Sox um, necessarily because they're super hard to get there with on, on full slates. But I think pieces could be found here. Yoan Moncada, Luis Robert, notably the favorites. And then maybe throw in a Benintendi uh, to get some left-handed coverage or a Gavin Sheets, maybe a Yasmani Grandal behind the plate, something like that. I think that's all playable from the White Sox over here. I'm kind of off of the Orioles a little bit. I You're getting, what, north of 9 to 5 uh, into betting markets here. And I think that's kind of attractive getting, what, plus 185 or so right now uh, on the White Sox. Yeah, might be a reasonable punt to take a look at uh, into betting markets. In DFS, I think the Baltimore Orioles here are a bit too expensive. I'd kind of rather try and, construction-wise, get to a little bit of Jesse Schultons, but... Um, don't tell anybody I said this because uh, he is terrible and I'm not comfortable with it at all. Okay, let's move on to Washington and Toronto. Here's the game. I'd rather play some Toronto. Um, I don't want to do any of this McKenzie Gore nonsense. Uh, no thanks. Uh, I love the K stuff. I do not like the power. Um, and I don't like the roughly neutral ground ball to fly ball uh, against right-handers, right? He gives up 36% hard contact here and a 200 ISO nearly. He's not so much in batting average to the right-handers, but he gives a batting average to some lefties in a shorter sample. But So this makes for a, a really intriguing stack for Toronto tonight. Um, I really kind of like it when you've got power problems, fly ball problems in the opposite side of the platoon, and then batting average problems and just straight contact problems in the same side of the platoon. Um, that makes for... You know, really viable tournament stacks, I think, especially with teams like Toronto, who are going to be very heavily platooned tonight with the right-handers. Um, we'll have to keep an eye on what they do with, like, a Brandon Belt. He's been a staple in there for most of the season. And 
Uh, he, however, could get a night off against a, a really high upside, um, at least in terms of strikeout, left-hander tonight with Mackenzie Gore. Still has 30% Ks there, and Brandon Bell strikes out at a 35% clip against everybody this season. So uh, we got to be careful. Um, and I think Toronto, that means they're likely to have – um, you know, just Vladdy there. You don't have to worry about choosing or anything. Uh, David Schneider's going to be in there. Uh, they'll probably still have Dalton Varshow or maybe like a Kiermaier uh, in there from the left side. Um, I don't really want to go out of my way because they're still in the downside of their platoon, you know, to be mixing them in in tournament stacks or anything. Um, but I think it's viable that we – Let's get DraftKings out of the way. Uh, viable that we consider some Toronto. Um, they're at playable price tags. I'd rather play them than Baltimore, as I mentioned. Vladdy, I do like it 52 here. Wit is okay, uh, even due to the lack of power here. It's, just, it's an upside contact spot for him. Not going to strike out a lot and should be able to lift the baseball here. Maybe hit for um, you know some doubles. Maybe swipe a bag against a lefty or two. George Springer, not super crazy about the 4,800, but it's okay. Um, not wild about Allie Kirk at 32 or Danny Jansen necessarily as favorite catcher plays, but certainly playable in stacks. I do like a little bit of David Schneider here at 4,300, dual eligible second in the outfield. You can play both him and Witt if you choose. So something from Toronto could absolutely be found and um, as kind of a peek behind the curtain here. In my first build this morning, they were my uh, second most exposed stack, the Blue Jays. So um, that's intriguing to take a look at here. And you can even correlate with some Josie Barrios, 8,800. I'm not super thrilled about the price tag, and that's what's going to keep my personal ownership down. But I've got no real problems here with where the market is at about 10, 12 percent. Um, I came in at about half this. But it's mostly just due to constructions, and I want to play a lot of Atlanta again tonight and some expensive you know, Blue Jays over here, for example. And it's going to be hard to fit all of those teams in and all those players because they're all expensive. And Josie at 88, I have no problems with the price tag, right? I love the projection, obviously. I, I do like a, a you know, pushing 30 value score for any starting pitcher. Um, it's just a construction thing. I've got really no problems here in the plate discipline for the most part. I, he's leaving some strikeout stuff on the table naturally. Uh, it's kind of inverted this year. He's historically had much better K stuff to the right side, but he's at sub-22% there with a nearly 24% number to the lefties. Gives up a little bit more pop, 180 ISO to the left side, and some batting average at 275. But it's the hard contact that really keeps him in play here against lefties compared to last season, for example, when he was giving up, what, 35, 38% hard contact and at a 250 ISO nearly. So uh, to the lefties, at least. Um, he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, so he can get taken apart on occasion. But for the most part, this is a pretty low upside offense. We're not worried about uh, a bunch of hard contact necessarily or raw power. Um, and they hit a lot of ground balls. He's still going to be able to keep himself in out of a lot of trouble because he is efficient, uh, doesn't walk a lot of guys, has good chase still at 32%, and the 29% CSW is still very much attractive. So despite a very uh, difficult strikeout matchup, 19% in aggregate for the Nationals here against right-handers this year, they're just 88 WRC+. plus. I think this is a fine suppression spot, and I'd much rather play Josie Barrios tonight than, you know, Kevin Gosman at 11-2 last night, for example. So um, would I be surprised to see a similar type of 17, 20-point outing from Barrios? Uh, no, of course not, because they're still pretty sticky. C.J. Abrams, still really great numbers. We talked about him last night uh, as being the one guy. He swiped three bases, and he was in the optimal lineup. Um, Kabert, I do kind of want to play some Cabert Ruiz here tonight. Um, he kind of jumped at the, off the page at me a little bit uh, today. I'm I, I'm really kind of chasing some more power upside for Cabert. He doesn't strike out at all, so I'm not really worried there. Uh, and he's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, making a, a little bit more hard contact this season is Cabert, but he's still you know well below what we want. Um, so those are really still the only two guys I'm – even remotely concerned with, not concerned at all with the right-handers, Lane Thomas, Manessis, um, or Alex Call, anything like that. So that's not really an issue. I have no problems playing some Barrios, but like I said, it's just a construction thing that's going to keep my personal ownership down for the most part. But I like him in tournaments. Uh, I do think he's got 25 because 
I do think he's going to get some run support here against Mackenzie Gore um, or with the Blue Jays against Mackenzie Gore. So uh, that's kind of how I want to play it. I do like Toronto. you got to lay nearly 2-1, to one, so I'm not thrilled with that. Um, but I think they're very much in play in DFS here as intriguing tournament stacks. Okay, let's move on. Texas and the Mets. Uh, I'm less on Texas tonight than I was last night. Um, I mean, Bruce Bochy came out and sat Mitch Garver for some asinine reason. Uh, and they put, like, Robbie Grossman in the five hole or whatever the hell they did. So that was really frustrating. Kind of took me off of Texas a little bit. I'm even more off of them tonight because Jose Quintana is very much in play here. We'll get to him in a sec. Andrew Heaney also kind of in play. Now, I don't trust Andrew Heaney. Um... The walk rate is a problem. The barrel rate is a serious problem for me. And the Mets don't strike out a lot, man. His strikeout stuff against right-handers is still, you know, tick, tick and a half above average or whatever. Against lefties, not so much. Tick, tick and a half below average. Um, it's not the batting average that he really gives up. It's just inopportune contact. He gets on the barrel, excuse me, and he just, like, to right-handers notably, he just gives up homers, right? And he gives up a lot of power. So I don't trust the guy. Um, he has strikeout upside, but this is a poor strikeout matchup. The Mets are still sticky, even though they're a terrible offense. 95 WRC+. plus. I am honestly shocked that it's this high, even this late in the season. 21.5% K rate. They don't hit for any average. Sneaky pop, but mostly coming from Pete Alonzo that hits, and, and maybe like a Frankie Alvarez, Frankie Lindor a little bit. Um, but below average hard contact rate, even a below average WOBA split adjusted. So they're not overly impressive. Just a 700 OPS as a team against left-handers. That's a really poor figure to be quite honest. Um, so do I want to go after him? Well, I, yeah, I always want to play right-handers that can lift the baseball, make hard contact and hit for some power. That's Pete Alonso for sure. First base plays today uh, are, are pretty loaded, as as we are normally at first base. 5300 price adjusted, probably not my favorite, but I've got no problem playing PD uh, against lefties that give up power pretty much ever. am a little intrigued with a Frankie Alvarez and Mark Vientos. I do like 2400 for Vientos at third base. He's a fine filler piece, or a one-off even. And a Frankie Lindor, of course, from the right side, still hits for some power. 5,100, certainly not my favorite shortstop play. And if you want to mix in a Brandon Nimmo or even a Jeff McNeil for some reason um, to make a five-man, a Danny Mendick, whatever, he's cheap, okay, fine. But not super thrilling to be playing the Mets here for me tonight. Um, so that's going to have to put Andrew Heaney in play. Now, in my first build, I got, uh, what did I get here, 8% of Andrew Heaney. I came in exactly with the field, um, literally right at 8.1%. So... Uh, that kind of gives you an idea as to where I am with him. I've got no real strong takes on Heaney. Uh, I do want to play a couple of guys against him, and I don't really want to get more than what I got here. Um, I'd rather pivot it elsewhere in these in this respective price range. And we'll get to some guys, um, you know, notably uh, a lot cheaper. And honestly, I'd probably rather go a little bit more expensive too. Um, maybe one guy about 400 cheaper, like Alex Cobb we talked about. So. That's kind of where I am with Andrew Heaney and the Mets here tonight. Josie Quintana, I do kind of want to play him a little bit. Uh, 6,300. I'm worried about, you know, pure swing and miss. I'm obviously worried about Texas. Um, I hate, hate, hate going after Texas. Right here in, with Houston, um, you know, the, these two lineups are the best in, in the American League. And they're incredibly difficult to go after, whether with a righty or with a lefty. It doesn't really matter. So I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the raw swing and miss and when these guys make contact, it's usually pretty damn good contact, right? 123, 123 WRC plus, 281 batting average for Texas against the lefties this year, 36% hard, 185 ISO, and a 353 Woba. Um, and that's super hard to get through, right? Neutral ground balls per fly ball. The guys you're really scared of, Semyon, Addy Garcia, Mitch Garver, like, all these guys lift the baseball from the right side of the plate, and you're always terrified, at least I am, of Corey Seager, lefty or righty. So this is not an easy matchup for Jose Quintana. Would not be surprised if he survives for 15, 18 points maybe. Would also not be surprised if he kind of pops at this price tag. There is upside for him at 6,300. He's a better arm than this price. 
Um, so he's not getting the respect he really deserves. It's just a raw swing and miss that I'm concerned with. 9% swinging strike rate is an issue, and 24% CSW is an issue. But he's efficient early. He ha- still has chase. He's walking some guys a little bit. Um, you know, but we got short sample here for Josie Katana since he was hurt for most of the season. I think there's noise here. I think the strand rate would come way, way up for him. He's historically a higher ground ball pitcher um, than this buck 15 suggests. We do have a 370 ERA with expected pointing well north of that, which is just kind of whatever. Again, we've got a short sample, only a 70, 175 hitters that we've seen for him this season. Um, I think this is intriguing. Now, there's a, a, another guy at, at 6,000 flat that I'd much rather play. But if you need to get to double punts on the mound, I think Jose Quintana is very well within consideration. Wouldn't be surprised if he gets absolutely bludgeoned because this is a super difficult team to go after, uh, and I hate doing it. But I'm going to have a little bit, and I did have some, uh, kind of a concerning amount. I got uh, yeah, about double the field nearly here in my first build this morning. So um, a little kind of gulpy, but he's super cheap, and he makes a lot of stuff work. And if you want to play expensive offenses this is how you have to do it similar to last night like you could have played Tyler McGill I didn't play any of him but he popped for 23 points and that could have been uh, very serviceable for you at what 5800 so Jose Quintana in a similar spot here tonight so that's kind of how I want to approach it I don't want to go after Quintana I really respect him the batted ball profile mix however with you know the numbers are the numbers even though historically they're different than this uh, they are what they are this season so um, you can play some Semyon, Addy Garcia, Mitch Garver. I still like at 3,800. I think price adjusted, my favorites are probably going to shift over to like a Zeke Duran, Jonah Heim today. Um, if I'm you know, totally price agnostic, I always love Seager, Semyon, Addy Garcia, and Garver, of course. Uh, but that's kind of how I want to approach this game. Mostly a write-off, but intriguing in tournaments for a piece here or there. Okay, let's move on to Houston and Boston. Houston went off last night. Boston, yeah, maybe not so much. A couple guys got there, sure. I'm going to approach the game the same way. I'm not going to play any pitching here tonight with J.P. France. I think he's too expensive for the swing and miss that he offers in this matchup. And same thing with Brian Bayo for the swing and miss that he offers in this matchup um, against Houston. So I like attacking J.P. France with right-handers normally because he has a really, really good cutter change combination, stays down with the curveball as well. Two ground balls per fly ball to the lefties, sub-100 ISO, 26% hard contact. It's, it's all fantastic. Really not a lot of batting average either, and just no swing and miss. 21%, though, it's not a horrific number. It's below average for sure, but he's it, he's excellent against the left side. It's right-handers that we want to go after, and with 286 batting average, 350 Woba nearly with a 185 ISO allowed and a 15% strikeout rate. Uh, unfortunately for Boston, they you know, most of their best hitters are hitting from the left side. And that's Devers. He is going to be the favorite. He's not the favorite price-adjusted third baseman for me today. Uh, but I'm certainly fine playing him, as I am really every night with him. Uh, Justin Turner at 4,900, kind of stiff. He'll, he's going to make a lot of hard contact to be able to lift the baseball still. So batted ball-wise, perhaps not the best matchup. But hard contact and uh, pure contact rates are very attractive for Turner. Same thing with Adam Duvall. Uh, I'm okay playing him. Not my favorite price adjusted, um, you know, $4,800 outfielder necessarily tonight. Masataki Yoshida at 47. I I think this is probably not the spot for him. He hits way too many ground balls. Makes a lot of contact, but way too many ground balls. Same with Alex Verdugo. Tristan Casas, batted ball wise, is attractive, but again, JP France excellent against lefties. So I'm kind of off of Boston here, despite a, a pretty high run total or expected run total for them. Uh, here in the betting markets. Um, Sedani so Raphael, they just called up. He's a high upside hit tool from, um, you know, he'll be in the outfield. And I think this is very viable. He's 2,000 if you want to mix in a an upside. He's got like a nearly 1,000 OPS in the upper minors and about 200 PAs this season. So it's very viable at, at 2,000 flat. Would love if they, you know, sit Verdugo or, or something and, and lead off Sedani. Um, and 
and that that'd be really attractive as a matter of fact so he's in play if you want to get to a short little boston sack or something against jp france do have to worry about a little bit of weather here tonight um but you know that that's fine if you want to get to some boston pieces uh it's Don's really going to make it uh, cheap for you down at 2000 Brian Bayo at 8000 Like I said, I, I think he's a bit too expensive in this matchup. Uh, with everybody healthy over here in Houston, like it, this is an impossible team to go after. 21% K rate, and this is going to continue to go down with Jose Altuve um, you know, back healthy and actually contributing to this number now. 102 WRC Plus for Houston against right-handers, so they've struggled, but they've had Jordan Alvarez. He was out for two months. Jose Altuve was out for three uh, et cetera, et cetera. They still got some guys that will swing and miss, like a Chaz McCormick, uh, John Singleton, Jeremy Pena against righties. Josie Abreu was dreadful for the first three and a half months of the season against everybody. So that's really dragging a lot of the aggregate numbers down. But Altuve, Bregman, Alvarez, Kyle Tucker's been fantastic. Yiner Diaz against righties this season has been fantastic also. Even though Chaz got some, a, lot of, a lot of power numbers, does strike out a bit. Um, you know, they're very difficult to go after here, and the ISO number is actually quite low uh, for a fully healthy Houston lineup. I really like playing Brian Bayo a lot because he induces a, a good few ground balls, right? 2-0 in aggregate here, a little less so to the left side than the righties where it's 2.5 nearly. So if we're going to go after him, it's going to be with some lefties. So that's Jordan Alvarez, that's Kyle Tucker. John Singleton, he's going to be able to make some contact here, but uh, he's got a really short sample. And outside of that random two-homer game that he popped for, he's been dreadful um, in a very short sample, admittedly, but he's not been great. Um, and, I mean, he's been kind of a journeyman his entire career for a reason. So uh, he's super cheap if you want to mix in a $2,600 first base piece and get to a three-man, Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tucker, uh, John Singleton. Little stack, I think that's fine. Uh but I'd probably rather prefer to just play some left-handed pieces, maybe throw in an Alex Bregman if we want to do a top-of-the-lineup type of stack. He hits the ball in the air, at least, and doesn't strike out. So uh, I'm okay. These guys are still going to make some hard contact, um, but I don't want to play 6,200 for Josie Altuve. It's too many ground balls. So it'd be Bregman, Alvarez, Tucker, and Yiner Diaz. He could lift it a little bit also, and he's got great numbers uh, this season in his, um, I guess, sort of debut um, action here at the big league level. So that's kind of how I want to approach it. Uh, I do like Houston here. Once again, they're always a very intriguing tournament stack going after Brian Bayo, probably less enthused than I was last night going after Chris sale. And I wasn't all that enthused going after Chris sale. So that's kind of where I am again with Houston. I'd much rather if I'm paying these price tags, much rather just play Atlanta. I think it's a far higher upside and uh, far more probable spot uh, than for Houston or for Boston here, for that matter. So let's move on. Uh, Cleveland and Minnesota. Uh, Gavin Williams going for the Guardians here tonight. 8600 It's the price tag that's going to keep me off. It's not really the plate discipline or anything. I'm a little concerned with the elevated walk right here. Short-ish sample, 30 innings this season, 15% walks. We need to get this under control for him. He's really got to dial in the changeup and get more value out of the curveball here. Um, and his walk rate. And the swing and miss to the lefties will come up commensurately when he figures that out. But um, he did just make his debut, what, you know, two months ago or something. We got full 12 starts on him. And everything in the plate discipline outside of that questionable walk rate is pretty damn good. It's 64% strike one. That's fantastic. That's why I am I think the, the walk rate is a little bit fishy here. That'll come down as he gets more comfortable going after big league hitters. 28% chase, we'd like a little bit more out of him, but I, as I mentioned with the curveball, once he gets more value out of that and the change, that number will come up too. 29% CSW already because he's got a 13% swinging strike rate. This is fantastic, and he doesn't get barreled. So I love playing Gavin Williams. I want to play him more so against righty-heavy teams, and the Twins are not necessarily going to be that. right? They're going to platoon, and we talked about them last night um, in a good a really strong stack matchup. Royce Lewis, they've moved him up to the two hole. Uh, finally, Rocco did something super sharp with the lineup. And sure enough, Royce ended up in the optimal DFS lineup last night. Who'd have thought, huh? Um, Eddie Julian, I'm still fine playing this. He hits a lot of ground balls. So maybe not the best batted ball matchup here against Gavin Williams tonight, but he does give up some power at a 210 ISO nearly with 34% hard contact. Eddie can still lift it a little bit. And his problem is mostly swing and miss. So with a slightly depressed strikeout rate for Gavin Williams and the lack of a, 
a good changeup. I think that puts Eddie and Max Kepler and Matt Walner and Georgie Polanco, etc., etc., from the left side all squarely in play once again tonight. Um, I don't want to play any of the righties, though. Royce Lewis and Carlos Correa, they're totally off the board for me here. 122 ISO, 28% K rate. These guys are going to swing and miss. It's 28% hard contact. Even though there's some fly balls, it's not going to be all that strong fly ball of contact. So I don't really want to deal with that. It's just short pieces here in singletons for me for the Twins here tonight, uh, mostly in Eddie Julian, Kepler, and Walner, for example. On the other side, you got Pablo Lopez going tonight. Um, now, I, I love Pablo. Pablo's just been incredible this season. Everything in the plate discipline is fantastic, and mostly everything in the batted ball is fantastic as well. It gives up a little bit of batting average to the lefties, slightly elevated power, really to both sides, but a 150 ISO is, is perfectly respectable. Um, they're swing and miss to both sides. It's slightly depressed to the left-handers. That's because the changeup is, for the most part, kind of break-even. But 25% still two ticks above average. We don't have a problem there. The only question mark that I have, and it's not really, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of a straightened question mark, so to speak, um, is the line drive rate and a little bit of fly balls to the left-handers with Pablo. Uh, but everything is fantastic. I love the average exit velo. I love the pure homer rate. I love the barrel rate, walk rate. Uh, it's all excellent. And I love sub-10% ownership on the guy. Now, this is the the best pure arm on the day today. Um, and that probably, at least at this point in his career, includes Kershaw and same thing with Corbin Burns. Um, Pablo Lopez is just better at this moment. So at sub-10% ownership, this is why I think this is really intriguing to get to constructions like this. He's the most expensive guy today, and you still got a north of 30 value score on him with a push in 20 point fantasy point projection i mean this is really really strong so i think this naturally makes you contrarian if you fit in some pablo lopez and like a short little three-man twins or whatever and then you can get to some atlanta or do whatever the hell you want i think this is an intriguing construction to explore tonight and i'm going to try and get as much of this as i can um but he's still expensive right and that's going to prevent you naturally just due to the price tag um construction wise from getting to a lot so it makes sense that the ownership is this low. It also makes sense for me to try and get above this somehow and get contrarian with it because I think this is still a fine spot going after Cleveland. It's a difficult strikeout matchup, yes, but it's a it's an excellent suppression matchup because Cleveland is terrible. 135 ISO, 27% hard contact with ground balls. It's just that they hit for a little bit of batting average, right, and a 19% strikeout rate. So he'll give up some average to the left-handers. That would be the one concern, and with the price tag, how you could come off of Pablo. Uh, but I'm going to try and come in over this, I think, and see where it gets me. It might bite me in the ass, but uh, I think this is a winnable matchup for Pablo, um, and I really like the ownership. Okay, let's move on to San Diego and St. Louis. Man, I hate the Padres. They are just so bad. Uh, like, you should be relegated. Every one of them should be forced into retirement for getting destroyed by Adam Wainwright last night. Like, what are we doing? Um, in any case, they get Zach Thompson tonight. Another very good matchup. I'm probably going to go right back to him, and I'm probably going to smash my hand in the doorway once again uh, because this team is just terrible. They're so, so bad. All of their hitters should be a lot better than they are. Um, and there's a reason that the Dodgers are running away with this division once again. This team is eight games below 500, And they've got Tatis, they got Soto, they got Machado, they got Bogarts. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense um, from an offensive perspective. They struggled on the mound a little bit. But from an offensive perspective, they have underperformed significantly all season. And it's really kind of shocking that they've got a 116 WRC plus um, against left-handers this year. I, like, I don't know where they're creating runs at all, because it's certainly not whenever I play them. In any case, I'm going to go right back to him tonight. I know we're kind of going backwards here, but I want to attack Zach Thompson. Um, he's mostly a three-pitch guy here, four-seamer slider curveball. Doesn't have a change. So these right-handers should be able to make some contact. But, you know, what the hell do I know? 185 ISO allowed to the righties with a 265 batting average. Uh, short sample here for Zach Thompson. He's had a lot of appearances out of the bullpen. But the Cardinals, they've been screwing around all season because they haven't had any stability in the rotation, you know, or the bullpen for that matter. Um, 
so we got some noise coming in through the numbers, but I don't want to play him down to 56. I'd rather play Jesse Schultons, to be quite honest, and just close my eyes. Um, 56% strike one, questionable 9% walk rate. It's not horrible, but it you know it's not excellent by any means. The strikeout stuff is there, um, but I'm kind of worried about that. With the Padres, against lefties in particular, they're much more attackable with right-handers, even if they are Adam Wainwright. Um 185 ISO here and 32% hard. So I would not be surprised if they sort of piss down their legs again uh, or piss down my leg. But I'm also kind of concerned that Zach Thompson going to give up a little bit of pop here. So I'm going to have to go right back to him. He gives up too much hard contact to the right-handers. He does induce a lot of ground balls. So we want to get to some fly ball hitters. That'd be like... Uh, Guys that can lift it, of course. Uh, some Tatis, some Machado, and some Bogarts a little bit. Also, Kim, maybe not so much at 5,000. So a short three-man is okay. I think Garrett Cooper's really shown a, a good bit of power. Um, had a fine night last night. He was one of the few bright spots for them. 2,800, still a playable thirty or a, uh, first base piece. Luis Campusano from the right side. Got a little bit of pop as well behind the plate. That's probably fine. Don't really want to be playing a $3,800 eight-hole Gary Sanchez, for example. Uh, so you could find some Padres here. I'm probably going to get some eventually um, when I run my builds here this evening. But I'm really not thrilled about it because I'm super tilted uh, about last night. Um, let's go backwards. Here's Seth Lugo going for them on the mound. 7,900 against the Cardinals. Now, we've seen in the last three days, the Cardinals have been absolutely annihilated by, admittedly, three pretty damn good arms when, they, you know, when they're right uh, in Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, and Blake Snell. Blake Snell went off last night. Well, it's because he threw strike one. He still walked five batters. Um, but when this offense goes cold, they go really, really cold. And we talked about that yesterday. Seth Lugo actually does have enough to maneuver. He's got six pitches, throws a lot of junk. He's efficient early in the count. He's efficient late in the count, doesn't walk people. So he's going to pitch to contact a little bit. But for the most part, it's going to be pretty okay contact, at least against right-handers, and they're mostly right-handed heavy. They do have Tommy Edmond, Alec Burleson, Nolan Gorman from the left side. But that's pretty much it, And with Lars still hurt, et cetera, et cetera. So... They're going to be right-handed heavy. Still have six righties in the lineup. And Goldschmidt, Arenado, Wilson Contreras. We don't really want to deal with them against righties that are serviceable. And Seth Lugo against right-handers. Sub-250 batting average. 286 Woba. Pretty good number. 107 ISO. Really good number. 29% hard contact with ground balls. So that's how Lugo could survive here again tonight. He's an intriguing tournament play, but I do not like the price tag and the pure swing and miss upside that we're looking for. Um, at this respective price in this matchup. Because despite the Cardinals being cold, like in aggregate, they still only strike out against righties at a 21% clip. Still make 35% hard contact. Still hit for a 175 ISO. So it's still pretty dangerous here with Seth Lugo. Um, if we are going to go after him uh, probabilistically, it's with left-handers, right? 37% hard contact there. Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. So you want fly ball hitters. And notably, that is... A Nolan Gorman, 4,200. I think he's a really intriguing second base play here tonight. But Seth Lugo is in play if you land on it. I'm not going to go out of my way to do this at 7,900. I just don't like the pure upside um, you know, at this price tag. But I would not be shocked because when this offense is cold, you know, they are just absolutely dreadful. So that's kind of how I want to approach this tonight. Um, Padres, for sure. you got to lay 3-2 to two on them. Eh, seems like... Doesn't seem like there's a lot of value there, so probably stay off of that. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Lugo gets taken apart here a little bit because he is not Zach Wheeler. He is not Aaron Nola from the right side. So, you know, the Cardinals could kind of break out here a little bit, but, I mean, remember earlier in the season, their offense was, you know, pretty uh, terrible then as well. So um, that's kind of how I want to approach this game tonight. All right, let's move on to uh, Milwaukee and the Cubs. Corbin Burns and Justin Steele. Here's the two guys with the excellent cutters I alluded to earlier. Corbin Burns mains a cutter changeup combination, but he, he mixes in the curveball slider for the breaking pitches, and he's fantastic. Plate discipline is great. Um, we have questions with the strike one, right? Just 59%. He does walk some guys on occasion, and he can't elevate to pitch count. 
So at high price tags, that's what we run into uh, with Corbin Burns. We want very right-handed heavy teams when we go after him because it's pretty much across the board. The splits here are severely um, inverted, and it, 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 it's kind of surprising, to be honest. I think this is probably the most drastic split you'll see um, – you know, from a, a starting pitcher's perspective in baseball, it's because of this cutter. It's so, so good. 163 batting average with a 228 Wobe and an 075 ISO to the lefties, 28% Ks, 2-0 ground ball to fly ball with a soft contact rate rivaling the hard contact rate allowed at 21% for both. Against righties, however, the average goes up, you know, a little bit. I mean, at least compared to uh, the other side quite significantly, but it's still 235, still a pretty damn good number. Still 308 Woba, pretty damn good number. But he's attackable with fly balls here and some power at a 180 ISO, an 075 ground ball to fly ball, and 35% hard contact with 1.7 homers per nine to right-handers. It's the right-handers you want against him, so it would be um, maybe like a Seiya Suzuki, somebody that can lift the baseball a little bit. Um or at the very least, get it on the line here. He's still got a 24% line drive rate. Say Suzuki, kind of a ground ball hitter, but this is a good batted ball matchup, so being able to lift it, get it on the line here, uh, you know, could certainly lift it over the wall uh, against Corbin Burns. Uh, Nico at 58, I'm not going out of my way to do this, but he's also kind of a ground ball lean. That would be fine in stacks if you get there. Dansby Swanson, um, probably not so much. He's going to strike out a, probably a pretty good bit still. Um, and the downside of his platoon is certainly to right-handers, even though he would be fine in stacks. I don't want to play any lefties here whatsoever, so I really do like Corbin Burns right up there with Pablo Lopez. I think it's a fantastic spot for Corbin Burns to pop really, really hard tonight. And if I can make some 10-6 Corbin Burns happen, I've got no problems doing this, and I'm going to try and do it and go out of my way to do it because I think this is a really good matchup. The Cubs are going to platoon, um, and they just kind of run their guys out. David Ross just kind of... He's an old school guy since he was a catcher, uh, and he just runs this left, right, left, right, left, right split. He doesn't platoon a lot, and he doesn't play matchups. So Corbin Burns going to be able to capitalize on that. Um, you know, he doesn't give up a lot to right-handers, despite, I mean, in terms of raw batting average and you know pure base runners, we'll give up some power. So I'd probably rather just homer hunt with like a say a Suzuki uh, or something like that. Justin Steele has the other good cutter in the game. He, however, is just a two-pitch guy. Doesn't have four pitches in the arsenal. So at um, half the ownership, you know, give me uh, Corbin Burns at 1,100 more expensive. Yeah, but give me him instead because Justin Steele just has the two pitches, and he's is a lot more attackable with two pitches than Corbin Burns with four. So he is. Quite a significant reverse split as well. Look at these numbers against right-handers for Steele. 250 average, 280 Woba, 100 ISO with a 22% K rate, etc., etc. Uh, against lefties, 215 ISO. High strikeout rate there, but this is a short-ish kind of sample. Uh, so that's really the only difference that we see between him and Corbin Burns. A lot of hard contact to the lefties. Still some ground balls, uh, but... For the most part, very attackable with left-handers. And unfortunately for the Brewers, they are only going to have probably two lefties, if that, in the lineup here tonight. Um, and that would be Chris Yelich, and they might even sit him sometimes. So they could go with a full right-handed platoon, and that puts Justin Seal squarely in play at 9,500. I've got no issues with the ownership. I did come in at um, you know, well under this, but it's mostly, again, just a construction thing. I didn't make any deliberate changes in my build, so I just kind of ran some stuff. Um, and that's why I came in so so low here, but I'm going to try and get some, you know, closer to the field maybe, which is kind of a, a you know, uh, something rare for me to say, I should, um, I should say, I suppose. So, no problems really. I, yeah, I'm kind of concerned here with the price tag a little bit and the ownership. Um, so I'd rather just pivot it to more expensive guys or, or go elsewhere if that's the only concern. Uh, but fundamentally, I've got no problems going after the Brewers here tonight. They still strike out a lot against lefties, even though they are creating um, a little bit better. 95 WRC plus now. It's still a 25% K rate. Average hard contact, you know, average to below average power, etc., etc. So 
No problems playing both arms here tonight. Mostly going to stay off of offense. If I got to choose, it's like a – yeah, I prefer – the Cubs offense against Gordon Burns, but man, I really don't want to do that. So mostly pitching here for me. Okay. Pittsburgh and Kansas city. Here's the guy on the other side of the game. Uh, Cole Reagan's that I want to get to. We'll get to him in a minute. 5,000 Luis Ortiz. No, thank you. Um, now 5,000 is 5,000, but Luis Ortiz numbers are absolutely horrendous. 50% strikeout rate, 11 and percent walk rate, bad strike one, no chase, bad CSW here at sub 25% and a 12% barrel rate. So it's an absolute no. He does induce some ground balls, uh, but they got some fly ball hitters over here from the Royals from the left side, notably an MJ. He'll make a lot of hard contact here. Uh, and a, a Michael Massey, Drew Waters is fine too, as is a, a uh, Michael Beatty or, or, excuse me, a Matt Beatty um, or a uh, Kyle Isbell down at the bottom of the lineup from the left side. You can always play uh, Bobby Witt as well at 6,500. At shortstop, that's kind of stiff. But this is fine to go after Luis Ortiz. There's going to be a lot of walks, a lot of contact here, full 79%. Look at the hard contact rates in a really large sample uh, this season. 50% to the left-handers, 2.9 homers per nine, 38% to the right-handers, one homer per nine. So let's do it. 92.5 mile an hour average exit velo. This is egregious. So the Royals are one of the, my favorite stacks here this evening. Um, I want to go to them a lot more than I did last night going after Juan Oviedo. But tonight's a totally different story. And I want to play some tonight. I want to play some right-handers. I want to play some left-handers. And um, the they might be like my Padres of, of last evening, for example. Uh, this is a really attractive spot. I want to go after this. And I want to play a lot of Cole Reagans and a lot of cor correlated teams as well. 22% uh, ownership right now. Uh, I think this is low, to be quite honest. 6,000. Uh, I think he's way underpriced. Um, hit four of his last five starts have been incredible. Um, he got taken apart a little bit in a pretty difficult platoon matchup. Didn't quite have it against the Cardinals. And historically, Cole Reagan has struggled with some right-handers, but in some very attackable matchups, the Mets at Boston, at the Cubs, at Oakland, uh, he destroyed all of these teams. 8Ks, 11Ks, 9Ks, 11Ks in 6, 6 and 2 thirds, 6 and 6 innings. Fantastic. He's trending upward, and the price hasn't um, adjusted for that yet. The ownership is starting to, but this is the guy I want to play down here in the, you know, the super cheap range. Uh, and I want to come in. I'll probably end up coming over, and I came in at nearly twice the field here in my first build. That's without making any adjustments to anybody else. So it's that ownership is likely to go way, way up. Um, so I want to play a lot of him. He's got killer velocity. He had triple digits in his last outing. He's got impeccable control. Uh, this 9.5% walk rate is actually quite high and a little fishy uh, because he's got a very short sample here against left-handers, 15.5%. Good control against the right side, and that's mostly what he's going to see here tonight because the Pirates still platoon a little bit. Brian Reynolds should be back tonight. Just got a day off yesterday. Uh, Brian Hayes, Kutch, Connor Joe, uh, Paguero, Alika Williams, Jason DeLay, right? They're going to have seven probably right-handers in the lineup tonight depending on what they want to do uh, with, like, you know, Josh Palacios or Jack Sawinski in the outfield. So, they're going to platoon very heavily, and the numbers against right-handers this year, 228 batting average, 275 Woba with a 107 ISO and a 32% strikeout rate. Uh, it, just elite figures here, 23% soft versus 26% hard contact. It's just fantastic. I want to play as much of him as I can um, and basically just hope it doesn't burn me. Now, on the other side, if you want to get leverage or hedge pieces, whatever, if you get a lot of Cole Reagans, then, yeah, play Connor Joe. I love playing him against most every lefty in baseball. He's got fantastic numbers there. Kutch, I'm still fine with at 4,200. Brian Hayes showing a lot more power this season, not nearly as many ground balls. 4,300, that's fine, and you can still play Brian Reynolds hitting from both sides of the plate at 5,000. They're viable if you want to get to a little three-man stack or something as a leverage piece because Cole Reagans' ownership is probably going to steam here as we get later into the day. Um, and it's hopefully going to be due mostly, um, you know, to my bills because I'm going to have a lot. So that's how I want to approach it. Give me a lot of the Royals, a lot of Reagan, some Pirates just as leverage pieces, but zero Luis Ortiz. Uh, okay, here's Coors Field again, and we're going to approach it the exact same way we did last night. Um, 
However, 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 Charlie Morton could be in play here tonight. And at 8,500, I'd probably rather play Josie Barrios, for example. But, you know, Charlie Morton's got more strikeout upside. The problem here is that Charlie's throwing a curveball. And we're at altitude here, and you can't deal with this. You can't throw 50% of a curveball at altitude. You cannot do it. Um, now, he does have swing and miss, but he also has walks. And if he loses this curveball... It doesn't have the same type of break that it does at sea level, and it won't. Like, he's down to two pitches. Now, we did talk about earlier in the season with Charlie, the changeup was bad, the slider was bad, and if he were to lose the curveball, then he was going to get totally annihilated. And it happened at a couple of starts for him. Notably, one of them you know, came against these Rockies in Atlanta, uh, where he gave up, I believe, four... Five, in, five runs in the first couple innings. Did strike out a lot of guys because the Rockies are terrible and still strike out. But that if that happened down at sea level, like he could very much lose this curveball entirely at altitude. Um, and you do not want to play that game. So the ownership for me is a little fishy here at, at 9%. Um, I did come in with a couple of Charlie Morton teams uh, but I'm probably just going to exit. I don't want to deal with this. Like, for example, I, I came in with 8%. Um, that's too high for my liking. However, he's 8,500, and it's playable for Charlie because he's still got a 25.5% K rate, and this is a good matchup for him because he still does induce ground balls. The problem is that a lot of the ground ball rate does come from the curveball. So if he starts floating this, the curveball is going to turn into line drives, which he's already susceptible to, and hard contact which he's already susceptible to, and that's not a good recipe for success at Coors Field. If he starts walking people and loses his best pitch, he's now all of a sudden down to 15% distribution of a changeup and a slider with bad fastballs at altitude. So, like, what are you really going to work with here? So, super questionable. Um, in play in tournaments, because it can make you contrary, and certainly with some Atlantic exposure as well in correlated teams or something like that. But, like, yikes, man. Um, it's a pretty high projection, though, and a pretty respectable value score for somebody at Coors Field. So don't neglect this totally. It could pop for you. I'm probably going to leave it off because I've been trying to fade Charlie Morton literally for, like, the last three seasons. Um, and needless to say, I'm not nearly as wealthy as I probably could be. Uh, in any case... That's how we can kind of approach it, I think, here tonight. You can go after the Rockies. This team is still bad. They strike out, as I mentioned, 25% strikeout rate, buck 50 ISO. They do make hard contact, do get it on the line here against righties, even though they don't create a hell of a lot. Um, they got some young hitters here. They're still going to strike out and still going to make pretty poor contact. Lefties is who I historically mostly wanted to go after Charlie with, but he's gotten the power number really under control this season. It's hard contact. We need guys that can lift it. That's kind of uh, a little bit of uh, Ryan McMahon, maybe some Charlie Blackman. Charlie Blackman more so than McMahon. Um, Nolan Jones a little bit, but they're going to be pretty right-handed heavy. That's kind of why I'm questioning uh, the pure upside for Charlie Morton here. But he's definitely in play if you uh, land on a team here or there. Peter Lambert. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, now, this kid's really starting to come into his own. Okay, he's got three pitches he goes to work with. Thankfully, he stays off of the curveball. Um, the problem so far still is just a hard contact, man. Like, you cannot give up 45% hard with a neutral ground ball to fly ball ratio, especially when you're at, at Coors Field. Like, the walk rate's fine, right? The strike one rate is fine for still a, a pretty young arm. Um, but he needs some more chase. He's got to dial in better changeup and slider value. And establish more with the four-seamer. I wish he'd mix in a cutter or even a two-seamer because he throws a lot of his innings at Coors Field. But for the most part, he's starting to come into his own. I think you kind of need four pitches to be going after Atlanta. Uh, and you certainly don't want to be doing it at Coors Field. We saw what they did last night. It wasn't really off of uh, Austin Gomber necessarily. Yeah, they got him for a few runs. But it was off of the bullpen where they put up all the production. Well, the Colorado bullpen had to eat seven and a third last night and or six and a third last night uh and they're gonna be gassed um so it's if peter lambert gets into trouble one of two things is gonna happen they're gonna yank him and then the bullpen's just gonna get torched again right or they're gonna have to leave him out there and have him wear it 
and that's not a good uh, recipe to be taking shots at 5,400. I know this may sound super crazy, uh, but he's 5,400, and construction-wise, I think it's viable um, if you get to a, another expensive offense like a Houston or a Toronto to get down to this price range. I'd rather play Schultons or something in a bad matchup. Certainly don't want to go after Atlanta because the hard contact is just too much, and the barrel rate is just too much. Um, but I've said all of that to say this. I would not be shocked here to see Peter Lambert survive. He is better than these numbers have shown. He is running cold quite a bit. Right, he's given up a uh, roughly 260 batting average or so, uh, running a tick or so cold there. Uh, in the Woba, running about a percentage point cold. In the ISO allowed, running about two and a half percentage points cold. Um, you know, so there is positive regression coming for him as he gets more innings under his belt. I mean, you don't want to play him here, but don't be surprised if he maybe survives for four or five innings here and only gives up two three runs. Um, and and really kind of torches a lot of Atlanta teams. They're still very expensive. I have no problem playing them. I'm going to go right back to them, of course, um, and I'm going to play everybody. But yeah, I'm a little more hesitant tonight than I was last night uh, for whatever reason. Um, so it's kind of where I am on this game. I want to play some Rockies, definitely. Probably not as many as last night necessarily, but still some. Uh, I like Blackman and Zetovar, of course, and uh, Hunter Goodman, still 3,000, still playable. Michael Tolia, 3,300, still playable here. Got to be careful with the strikeout rate. I probably prefer some right-handers, maybe an Elias Diaz um, and Z Tovar. Brandon Rogers is still cheap as well. That's kind of how I want to approach this. All right, Oakland, Seattle. Uh, Ken Waldachuk, ay, 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 man. Um, it's similar spot to last night, 5,800. Price is going to put him in play, just as it did with Kyle Muller last night, who was bad. Um, but the fundamentals are, are going to take him out of play uh, for most everybody. And probably for me tonight, I don't think, I mean, I'd rather just play Cole Reagans, right? I, I pivot all of this exposure. Like, it's a different dynamic here tonight. Um, you know, you had to pay an extra 1200 to get to Kyle Harrison off of Moeller last night. You only have to pay 200 more to get off of Waldachuk to Cole Reagans, for example. So I'm probably just going to leave this off. This is another fine spot for the Mariners. Um, Waldachuk still just gives up way too much pure contact a lot of batting average here right two I mean, he's running cold still right 285 batting average nearly with a 245 expected so that's four percentage points it's not nothing right same thing with the woba category running about four ticks cold in the iso running about uh six ticks cold as a matter of fact so um you know like a 190 x iso is, is Absolutely elevated, you know, but it's not the average 260 roughly that he's given up. So, um, you know, th this is fine. Like, he's got some positive regression coming to him. It's not going to be all that impressive uh, no matter what. He still has a low strand rate, 69%, and a 5-0 expected with a 6-0 ERA, right? So we're looking for about a run, but let's not get it confused. He's still walking a lot of guys. Uh, he's still got a 90-mile-an-hour average exit velo. So... Um, bad strike one, bad chase, bad CSW here. I can't do it with Waldachuk here tonight. Even though there are some matchups sometimes where he can survive, this I don't think is going to be one of them. I'm going to go right back to Seattle, but it's not going to be with full stacks tonight, I don't think. Cal Raleigh probably be in there, and I prefer him much more so from the left side than the right side, and I don't want to do this uh, at 4,800. I'm not sure what uh, Scotty Service is doing up there. Um, should have played Cal Raleigh last night. Um... Ty France, I think, is okay here. Uh, not my favorite first base play. Kind of back into, you know, normal Ty France is not my first, first my favorite first base play range here tonight. Tay Oscar, I still love. Um, Julio, I still like, even though he, he got a $200 price bump. Um, this is Julio, and he's streaking really, really hard. He, he wasn't my favorite last night, but he put up 30, uh, and he was in one of the top five optimal lineups, I believe. So it's going to be short stacks. I like Geno still at, at 4,600. That's still fine. Um, like a Julio, Gino, Tay Oscar, probably my favorite little three man. If you want to play Dylan Moore, I think that's okay. Or Josie Caballero, 2,500 dual eligible in the infield. That's okay too. No problems playing Seattle. Not my favorite five man. Um, so short stacks, I think I'd prefer George Kirby going for them. 9,700. I love this man. I love George Kirby so much. Like he just doesn't walk anybody. And I think you guys probably know by now that this is 
like nothing gives me more joy than a pitcher just throwing strikes. Uh, even if you give up contact, man, I, like I don't care. So you have a defense for a reason. You've worked your entire life to be efficient in throwing strikes. So just throw strikes. And George Kirby does that, man. He hates walking people, and it it reflects in his numbers. You know, I know a lot of pitchers don't like walking people, but George Kirby actually performs. 69% strike one, elite chase rate, great CSW considering that he pitches to so much contact. It's 80% here. It's just because he throws so many damn strikes. 9,700 is a little concerning, right? The two guys in this range, Steele and Kirby, going to get most of the ownership. That's why I think, you know, pivoting up a little bit to Burns, Pablo, we'll get to Kershaw in a minute, uh, are kind of intriguing plays here. But I've got no problems fundamentally playing George Kirby in this particular matchup against Oakland, of course, as we saw Brian Wu just tore them apart last night. Um, if we're going to go after Kirby, though, it's going to be with some left-handers in terms of power. You're just going to want a homer hunt, really. He doesn't give up homers, though, so it's kind of difficult to do that. Uh, I'm a little more attracted to Seth Brown tonight because of the batted ball profile. He hits about 060 ground ball to fly ball. And George Kirby, um, compared to Brian Wu, doesn't give up nearly as many fly balls. So slightly more favorable for Seth Brown tonight. Ryan Noda is still very much in play at a neutral ground ball to fly ball profile himself. So those are, once again, the favorites. Um, I don't want to deal with any right-handers here really at all. Uh, Kirby's just a lead against the right side. And he's mixing in pitches that are going to keep him more competitive uh, against the left side with the sort of split change and a straight change here. As soon as he develops these out, uh, whichever one he chooses to go with, if he has both of them, I mean, he'll be like Darvish hard to go after with elite, elite control, like early career Aaron Nola control. Just absolutely fantastic. Um, he would be a top five pitcher in baseball if he, de if he develops these two pitches. Um, from a DFS perspective, real life perspective, whole nine yards. He's just, he's got that kind of talent. So I've got no problem eating a lot of ownership on him. Um, you know, if I end up pivoting a lot of my mid-range and, you know, kind of upper uh, price tier ownership to the more expensive guys, then this will just naturally keep me under. Uh, let's see, in my first build here, I came in, you know, about 20%. You know, so um, under the field, but still a healthy amount for sure with George Kirby. I don't really want to go after any of him. Um, you know, outside of maybe, you know, my token Seth Brown, uh, Ryan Nota pieces. Okay, let's move on. Cincy and San Francisco pitching once again in play here tonight. Um, you know, it turns out that Abbott got beat up a little bit and Kyle Harrison, you know, he was definitely the piece you needed. 6,500. I think Brandon Williamson could survive here because like these giants are against left-handers are absolutely dreadful. Um, 25% strikeout rate, sub-250 batting average, 133 ISO, and a 28% hard contact. I don't know where this 91 WRC Plus is coming from because it's not walks, right? It's not necessarily batting average. It's not, it's not power. It's not hard contact. So how the hell are they doing this? Um, so I want to maybe, maybe, maybe mix in a little bit of Brandon Williamson here tonight. I think he could be serviceable, even though he's got some severe problems, to right-handers with 085 ground ball to fly ball, 33% hard contact. That's not horrible necessarily. 210 ISO is elevated for sure, 22% strikeout rate. He's just far more attackable with right-handers than he is left-handers. Um, so, they're, yeah, they're naturally going to platoon. They'll probably have nine righties in the lineup. So that's not great from a pure upside perspective, but he's also still 6,500, and the price tag puts him in play against a team that doesn't create and doesn't hit for power. So it's not the best matchup. I'd much rather just play Cole Reagans if I'm choosing between the two, but you can play both of them if you need to get all the way down there. I don't think this is horrible. As we saw last night, contrarian pitcher pieces are can be, you know, it can be optimal. Um, Kyle Harrison wasn't necessarily contrarian, but Yohan Oviedo certainly was, and he was absolutely optimal. So um, that's fine to play some Brandy Williamson here tonight. I'm probably not going to get a hell of a lot because of my adoration for Cole Reagans here and for Alex Cobb on the other side, who we'll get to. Um, but if you need to get a little bit contrarian and pivot a little bit, or if you can't quite get up to Alex Cobb and you, you know, you've only got 65... Brandon Williamson is not a horrible piece to mix in. Um, and I, I did get some exposure. I got double the field here, which is not nothing. Um, you know, it's not something. It's not nothing. Alex Cobb going for the Giants. I do want to play him. I think he's too cheap. 
Um, now, this lineup over here for the Reds, why Harrison popped so hard last night, it, like, they lost Matt McClain, and now Matt McClain, Johnny India, and Joey Votto are all in the DL, and we're dealing with a pretty inexperienced lineup for the most part. You got Nick Bartini in there as a five-hole hitter. Like, let's like, let's slow down with how good the Reds' offense can be anymore with all those other guys hurt. 95 WRC+, plus. this number is going to be you know, way, way south. Um with this lineup. So I want to play some Alex Cobb, and this is why he's popping in the ownership markets here so far today, and it makes sense. I, the price tag's just too cheap. He's been pretty poor, um, you know, really all season uh, from a an actual, I guess, an expectation standpoint. Um, had really high expectations coming into the year for Alex Cobb because of the high ground ball rate and the the – high strikeout rate, but he's totally lost it against the left side. So this is how he's attackable from a contact perspective. Gives up a little bit more power to right-handers, but like whatever. Do you really want to be going after this two and a half ground ball to fly ball ratio with the Reds in San Francisco tonight? I really don't. So they're way down the list for me. Um, you know, one of the bottom three in probability so far. So um, I think Alex Cobb is... is due for a really, really good outing in a good matchup. He's had some difficult spots at Philly. He had Atlanta, Texas, Arizona, and he struggled in those matchups. Second time he saw Oakland in, you know, what, three starts, uh, he got beat up a little bit. But the first time he saw Oakland, he tore him apart, went six innings, struck out nine. I think this is a similar lineup to Oakland and Seattle, who he also tore apart seven in, or six innings, seven strikeouts. Those are, have been his best outings. I think the Reds lineup tonight is likely to be kind of similar uh, with pretty low upside, despite having Ellie Spencer Steer, good hitter, uh, TJ Friedel, little sticky, E3, good hitter. These are all good hitters, but not necessarily at this level and not necessarily in this matchup. So I do like Alex Cobb. Um, I actually came in over this figure. Not much, but uh, I did get more exposure than the field here. So no problem playing Alex Cobb here tonight whatsoever. I'm probably just going to stay off of offense. Uh, even in this game, I don't really want to be playing anybody from the left side or the right side from that matter against Alex Cobb. So, um, and righties against Brandon Williamson, if I end up getting some exposure, yeah, sure. You could play like a little three man. I don't know. Austin Slater, Tyro Wilmer Flores type, uh, something like that. JD Davis. I like again at 3,500 hits a lot of ground balls here. So the batter ball profile matches up fine. Patty Bailey is fine, too. They're all very, very cheap. Um, so if you do get to a an expensive pitcher on the mound, for example, and an expensive stack like in Atlanta, maybe with a Kansas City or something, um, you, know, you know, you could mix in a three-man Giants with the, the Royals or, or an expensive, you know, double pitcher combination, something like that. That's a very contrarian build and very much in play. Okay, last game of the night here. Let's get to Arizona and the Dodgers. Um, Merrill Kelly, 9,100. I can't do this. Same thing with last night. The hard contact rate is just a serious concern. And Merrill Kelly, uh, I, I love playing him at zero ownership, effectively. Um, I don't want to play him in this matchup because I think the hard contact is really going to bite him. The ground ball to fly ball ratio here is a little concerning, as a matter of fact, because both right-handers and left-handers are going to match up really well uh, for the Dodgers, you know, Mookie, Will Smith, uh, in particular from the right side, Freddie Freeman, Max Muncie in particular from the left side. Um, I mean, Jason Hayward, he was in the optimal lineup last night, so hopefully he's starting to turn things around after being dreadful for the last couple of months. David Peralta, still 3,100, still making pretty solid contact, not hitting for a lot of power, but not striking out a lot uh, necessarily. So James Outman still cheap etc etc i think dodgers are very viable i couldn't get to them last night because i